Welcome to YouTube's favorite comic book channel, Cartoonist Kayfabe. My name is Ed Piscor. I'm Jim Rugg. Birth of the MCU is the subject of today's video, but you got to let you guys know we have a Patreon out there where you can support the channel, keep these videos coming to you on a regular basis. Uh, the King Kayfabers mitigate the Kayfabe effect because they have access to the videos before anybody else, and they're watching us record these videos uh, in real time if they're up early enough, man. The vids are brought to you by the books that we make in 2023. Big year for cartoonist kayfabe. Uh, off the bat, man, I want to let you guys know that there is a Hip Hop Family Tree omnibus collecting the four volumes of Hip Hop Family Tree that are, that are out there. In one big-ass hardcover book, 504 pages. It's going to be a 140 pages of all-new material. This is going to be this like very sexy gold foil, man, like uh, right in front of uh, Grandmaster Flash there. Uh, there are two trade paperbacks of my Red Room series out there. We're working on the last mini series right now, Red Room Crypto Killers. This is the cover for issue number one. This is the cover for issue number two. Going to start coming out on a monthly basis in May. There are three volumes of X Men Grand Design out there right now. And WYSIWYG. Jimmy has a forthcoming Street Angel Princess of Poverty, which is collecting his uh, earlier Street Angel works that are before Street Angel Deadliest Girl Alive. You have this trade paperback. You need this one to complete your stuff. Yeah, if you don't have either, go put in those pre-orders right now at your shop or at whatever uh, mechanism is most convenient for you. Jimmy's also the author of Hulk Grand Design and the artist behind the Plain Jane's Shoujo graphic novel that came out from Little Brown. Without further ado, Jimmy, let's take a look at Human Torch number five. Uh, this is a reprint from 1999, uh, that you could, you could find this in the quarter bins, man, and I think it's worth having for historic value, and it is, uh, precisely the reason I scooped it up. Very famous comic, because this is the first major crossover that's like an issue length, man. There's a piece in the back from Roy Thomas, who's, you know, deep scholar of superhero comics, talking about there were interactions between Namor and, uh, and, uh, the Human Torch prior to this, but they would be, you know, one page, two page, maybe a little schmoz, but nothing major. This is Balls to the Wall 64 pager that is a comic book of legend because uh, it was drawn in like, you know, started on a Wednesday and finished on a Monday uh, with, they said, about six writers, about a dozen artists. Dudes literally hanging out in the bathtub with a drawing board uh, to do a couple of pages here and there. We start off with uh, fantastic, what's the word, imitable, inimitable, how you say that word? You, you can't imitate Alex Schoenberg. Very distinct style, and you know the distinction? It's his color palette. It's that red, green, yellow is so often used in his colors. And totally. In his, his covers. You know, like, you're LB Coles, like, those guys would use that stuff, but the precision in detail yep. is something that you would not get from comic book men of, of these days. We're looking at a comic from 1941, the comic strip has been established for 40 years at this point, 45, 50 years. And that was the sexy place to be if you were going to marry words and pictures up. The comic book is more proletarian, man. It's cheaper. Uh, it's people who couldn't hack it in the more prestigious platforms. I'm going through major comic strip binges. These days, man, I got a rotating cast of books that I that I read uh, every week uh, from the old strips, and starting in like 1931, like a little Abner comic from the start is so much more readable and and uh, elegant, for lack of a better word, than the comics that we have here. But these comics absolutely have their place, and I was just thinking in context while reading it because it is such a crazy divorced reading experience and anything that you're familiar with this this is like uh this it's 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 proletarian art it's it's outsider art these guys couldn't make it in the more prestigious comic strips but they're still making stuff and there's a lot of fascinating stuff that happens if you allow yourself to open up to the context of the situation yeah, and there, there's a lot of weirdness around this stuff. Like, I brought this, and I don't know that we need to look through it, but it's a collection of comics from this time period, late 30s, early 40s, and it kind of illustrates exactly what you're describing, Ed, in that, like, it's a different form, and yeah. they're trying to figure that part out. And then the other part of this that's different is what those strip artists is getting paid is probably about 
10 issues worth of what a comic book artist is getting paid. Right. And, you know, time is money. So these guys are dashing out these comics as fast as they freaking can because they're getting paid nothing. Right. You know, it's this is post-depression era. They are often very young and, and kind of unskilled, um, you know, not in league with these high-end comic strip guys and combine that with like we're doing eight pages instead of four panels it's a it's a really different form that is just finding its like language yeah by the way i read the wrong thing uh, that, that's fine <laughs> i read uh marvel mystery comics uh eight nine and ten which is 1940 and uh much rougher art than than what i'm seeing here even though it's bill everett and carlos burgess are still credited with that yeah like let me tell you something crazy about this issue because of like those weird male laws rules circulation issues i think there are two human torch number fives <laughs> <laughs> so uh i could see how it could be a mis you could mismanage that but uh guess what it ain't much of a reading experience don't matter that much uh but it is the the a very famous crossover between submariner and human torch i had to do my little call out to it in uh, in uh, X Men Grand Design, the first volume, they call Namor a mutant, mm -hmm. and so he was established as like you know the first mutant in the Marvel universe. So I had to have this piece. The the citizens of New York like do not fare as well in my comic as they do in uh, this Human Torch comic because you read this caption that like, don't worry, everybody was forewarned <laughs> and they and they got to underground bunkers and all that stuff. And I just think, like, especially with some of the uh, issues that we've dealt with in the past couple of years as a, as a community, there are people who listen, there are people who don't listen. There was that guy who, like, lived on the bottom of Mount St. Helens who was like, you know, Gabby Hayes, like, I'm not moving anywhere, yeah, this that, is my that, land. That doesn't live there anymore. He done melted. Maybe his shadow's stuck there or something. But uh, there's also that great Alex Ross image from that uh from his pitch or is it issue one of uh yeah this yes, is issue, issue one. one it may have been in the pitch though because if you're gonna pitch this where else are you coming from there you it know, is, like man. this would have been like your uh, your money shot he did that great like i always thought his human torch that's how you sell that proposal steeped in the burgos tradition mm -hmm. man where you have the red android outfit with flames abounding check this out jimmy uh they <laughs> it's so funny how how do you get these characters over and like there's there is some editorial stuff that's even rough, uh, and I don't know how you get Bill Everett to agree to this, but I think he was in the war, so maybe he maybe he didn't have much say or something. Uh, there are four horsemen of destruction, and their names are written in blood: Hitler, Mussolini, Death, and Submariner. <laughs> so, like, why would you want your main character, your bread and butter? To be associated with those guys, but you're creating the ultimate superhero, like, heel baby face match. So you have to make them as bad as, like, the worst dudes. It's weird, too, that Namor is such a villain and yet is one of the lead characters of Marvel, of Timely, you know, back then. As, as a kid, I was I was very sympathetic to Wiley Coyote, and I, I just wanted him to get Roadrunner one, one time, you know? So, like, there is that little id part of a child's brain that's like, I just want the bad guy to win one time and, and to kick some ass. Also, how sinewy must Roadrunner have been? It'd be the worst <laughs> bird to eat. And also, how sad was freaking Marvel that, like, Human Torch is their, is their <laughs> A-list superhero? Well, you know, the whole... Part of the reason I thought this is noteworthy is to illustrate, like, Marvel's not Marvel. You know what I mean? Like, they're no. just like everybody else at this time, and it's kind of what goes on a decade or two later that Marvel starts to become Marvel. <laughs> Uh, in terms of like this is although Bill Everett you know is a step above the glaring omission in uh, this comic is that uh, Captain America exists but he doesn't show up at all. The, there's like Angel, some other Patriot, and Little Toro. It's funny that the little boy is naked, <laughs> like <laughs> topless at, at the dinner table. Uh, you see this a couple of times. It becomes a trope. This is like this is a. Uh, Mars, you know, the god of war kind of looming over. And they're talking about, like, take take a good look, because this is the last time you're going to see America in its uh, peaceful state. You got humble villages, you got factories, and it's funny, in, in a post-Depression era context, because this just means employment, mm -hmm. but to you and I, that's just pollution yeah, that's and disgust, and, you know, there's a water system that's being fucking 
messed with and you know frolicking on the beach but like the the god of war is like looming over you'll see another example of that that's incredible to think of this is your snapshot of america circa 1940 yeah 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 and uh, like like what 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 are the perceived values uh of the day pretty wild i feel like almost every issue of this old golden age shit i read submariner is always turning heel like like he's a good guy and then he always revisits his hometown look at his hometown dude but like atlantis is just like a corn silo and like far a farm yeah that's funny <laughs> it's, it's really like they built a dam over it like in deliverance or something exactly. and it just flooded his old place yeah uh he's got like a first-hand view of some of the war stuff that's going on but then when he realizes what's underneath the ocean he's like oh man i gotta go check on my people this is a beautiful reproduction, by the way. Yeah. Because, like, some of the stuff that I was looking at has been recolored, like, from uh, modern times or whatever. And talk about the disservice. This is a great reprint. Going to check and make sure that his mom is all good. But uh, a lot of the Atlanteans, they didn't fare so well. So he's going to wage war. And it, it's like the Golden Helmet. Like, Samariner's taking it extra far. And he's like, you know, there are established guys who I consider dictators uh, on the terrestrial plane, man, there's his Hitler boob and this Mussolini douchebag. I want to be the dictator of all these guys, man. And, and these are the other generals and stuff who are like, yes, you are our leader. <laughs> Boy, great lettering throughout, too. I love, like, all the, oh, it's coming out of a speaker? How do we draw that? Yeah. Yeah, it feels very uh, much like the Siegel Schuster type lettering that would be very close to dra- drafting lettering. It kind of, kind of elongated very very clear Mm, great silhouette makes you wonder too like who these different artists hands are wow this is almost that ad that would be in the back of the comics of like 145 soldiers for you know 99 cents i ordered those once they're this big they were terrible they were the worst thing i ever mail ordered (laughs) mail order mysteries one of our early show show tell videos Get, get your hands on that uh there's a reporter character that must be a recurring Marvel character. You know, the, one of the noteworthy things of this issue is that it's one big giant story told in like four or five parts. Uh, most Marvel comics, like if you got to issue a Namor, it'll have a Namor story or two. It'll have a Human to- Torch story. It might have this like Casey, whatever the fuck his name is, uh, who's a reporter off doing, uh, you know, investigative journalism. I wonder if that was the seed for Marvels, you know, being shot from a reporter stand- point of view. Yeah. It's a really good gimmick. They all seem to have it. You know, like the detective comics would have that kind of thing. Yeah, instead of reporter, they should call him ex- expositor or something, you know. <laughs> Look at all this. So this issue has to be turned around quick, but you're also tasked with having to draw like really, really, really hard stuff. Yeah, it's amazing the uh, the story of everybody collaborating, working in bathtubs with lap boards and stuff. They said, they said that they would only leave the house for food and... And liquor. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they didn't have to tell us the liquor part. We've got the, we've got the proof here. When you look at the Golden Age comics, Warren Bernard comes over the crib and, and will crack open some old uh, CGC Golden Age books. The yellow does not fade at all. If anything, it gets brighter over time. So hmm. this is pretty accurate, man. Makes you wonder what's in that ink back then. <laughs> right. I love that the notes that the guy's getting uh, is lettered perfectly it could be a caption (laughs) right (laughs) this i was like what the hell he's like tweaking his own nipples and they're like look he thinks he's mussolini and you can see those old videos of mussolini standing in front of people he create mussolini is the creator of the run dmc b-boy stance like he's just like so showy when he crosses (laughs) those arms and is like looking and mugging for for everybody like just so on his high and that's what they're trying to do right there dude there's your life out captain america decades later i mean that's a pause moment if i ever seen one man he's sitting there (laughs) tweaking his nipples you know it's patrick bateman in the mirror (laughs) fucking some hookers and like little wet naked boys behind yeah (laughs) all the water is uh like motion device good stuff (laughs) <laughs> they do make the most out of this. Cool to see, like, your nine-panel grids and things, too. Early uh, standardization of comic book page layouts. There is no getting these guys over as superheroes in any way, either. So, like, Namor's this boob fucking villain, right? That's, like, a failed dictator. Yeah, triangle for a head. With, with you know, Mu- with Mussolini and Hitler. So, like, how does that make you f- feel about him? And there is at least two times in this issue that Human Torch gets shot with a squirt gun. 
and loses all superheroic momentum. <laughs> squirt gun <laughs> a squirt gun like if i didn't pass it up yet like we, we will come to it again feels like that should be worked into the ads you should be able to buy that squirt gun <laughs> there's our there's our uh dictators and our, our russian confederates how many comic books has hitler been in totally and just like think of the times like you just could not do that anymore man what didn't they try to do like a captain america versus the taliban at john cassidy joint is that was, was that the conceit of that yeah, thing i think it was written by the first blood author no 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 it was um where did he fuck. send captain america to afghanistan like like i think he did do one but the one that i'm thinking of is not that i don't i don't exactly know that one did john cassidy draw that for him i don't know about that and look at this remember Kazar, or is it Ron Friends called it? Kassar? Kassar. Is li- it becomes a biblical story, Jimmy. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And Kazar uh, decides to build a uh, an ark to get all wildlife on that thing to survive this, uh, this is cataclysmic amazing. fight. Do you think this is like the, the Kazar artist? This is his role in this comic? It in, could, in the comic jam? It could be, because that's what a lot of uh, this stuff was at this time. And it that would, is getting your guy over. It like, if be, I'm going to do this crossover, guess who's making a, a special appearance? Totally. Uh, Simon and Kirby are working on Captain Captain America pages. They're not tied with these guys. Like, Bill Everett is, like, establishing, you know, his wing with Submariner. Carl Burgos was tasked with the Human Torch stuff. It, it kind of wasn't thought of to have these other people involved other creative hands really like until the war broke out and then you get the real fucking triangle headed like this might be a, a bill everett uh submariner but there will definitely be ones where that triangle that yield sh- si- shape yeah. yield sign head is distinct that you that, that's not him. it's so interesting when you turn a page like this is a completely different it feels like a different different hand absolutely than the, than, the, than, the, than the previous spread and then you say bill everett and it's like yeah there's some really good draftsmanship here i could see that being bill everett you know he's a guy i think of as being really good so if the page is outstanding that's who i'm going to give credit to sure you know, may not always be true, but if you're just trying to guess. And also, like, the studios at this time, they pass pages. So, like, one dude's a background guy, one guy's an inker, one guy's this and that. There's probably several hands on every one of these pages. You can't be a successful dictator if you don't have your, like, Gaddafi type yeah. outfit. Hugo Boss has to design your outfit for you, <laughs> Circle World War Two. Look at his feminine-ass eyelashes, man. Yeah, the, the combo, of, like, the, the sculpted cheekbone and the super eyebrow. Mm-hmm. It, a monocle might go a long way on the name <laughs> You got the, you got the impending neat. death. I wonder if the Lev Gleason books are out at this point. I feel like that comes later. No, they're out. They're 41? Late 30s, yeah. They, they Crime does up. not pay? Mm-hmm. Uh, where there's like the, the spectral horror host kind of, kind of fella. Oh, you know what? No, I was thinking of uh, going into the 50s that they were in the 40s. So I don't know if they were out. Right. Yeah. Although, probably be close. Yeah, this is great. See, that feels to me like this is probably an Everett, <laughs> Bill Everett page. There's all these aquatic... Okay, yeah, we're getting into it, man. Uh, we're going to unleash nice. these octop- octopi mm-hmm. on Berlin. Uh, these are not sharks. These are soldiers who have shark camouflage. So we're going to have to <laughs> see that pay off <laughs> when, they, when they hit land and take off their shark suits. Wow. And Torch is, like, hanging out with him? Like, he's trying to talk sense into him? Uh, I forget how that was. Like, I, I do, yeah, I, he's, a, he's a prisoner or something. I love how... Uh, or no, like, you know what? He is going along with him. How outlandish this is. It's like they figured out we're going to do this crossover. Everything's going in here. Kitchen totally. sinks. Like, the, the whole thing is in this one. This whale That's great. is That's really amazing. a tank. I used to draw whales when I was a kid because I think their size, you know, and you read, like, how big they were. And I remember one time drawing a whale with the di- dining room set in its mouth. To illustrate, like, it's so big, it's, you know, it's this size. Totally. I should have put a can in it. That, that looks cooler than a dining room set. This is little Toro. He's in an underground hospital. And they're like, you know, we need to send him up top. Like, he's he's going to he's gonna die in here. He's not catching the right oxygen. Great panel. <laughs> Look at all of the comic stuff that's going on in that panel. Maybe maybe they got Fletcher Hanks to do that, that one. Maybe. Look, Napoleon's in it. Everybody makes cameos. See, this is a weird torch. That doesn't that's, look that's like torch. That's Toro. Oh, gotcha. That's the little boy. All right, man. So we set up all of our, our soldiers and weapons and stuff like that, man. Now it's time to unleash them across the world. 
There are whale boats. Look, look, it's all sp- spouting water as they show up. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. You get the two third uh, splashes on both these pages. Um, works out as a centerfold in this reprint. Who knows what the original was like? But man, in another two thirds page splash, like they really are filling pages. Jimmy, the sharks are showing up, and here they are right there. Right. Take, it looks like canoes on their back. That's really cool. And you cool. see them off into perspective. The Navy SEALs have those little subs that are right. just like one person kind of delivery vehicles. This is what I'm going to picture them like now when I read about them. And we're 34 pages in, by the way. And nose art makes another appearance. <laughs> Boy, and it's a lot of big panels now. We're not seeing nine panel grids anymore. Yeah, it looks like it's not long for this world also, by the way. I don't think it's built for the rapids. That rushing water is just so hard to draw. Yeah, it's a real shorthand that they're uh, that they're using too. It feels like little kid drawings. It, it's little kid story. It's little kid drawing. Uh, these guys, some of these guys, they might not have even graduated high school. Like zero of my grandparents graduated high school. You probably have teenagers working on this. There's almost certainly teenager hands on this book. Great silhouette, man. Look at look at death. Over the over these European villages. Fantastic. What a panel. <laughs> Death and Hitler together. But man, like these silhouettes in front of that fire, beautiful. So lurid. How are they coloring that? I know, right? Because you see the brush strokes. And we don't know if that's some kayfabe like for this edition or what, but I saw some brush strokes and some earlier stuff also. There's some in like the blues and stuff there that look they look authentic. They do. Like I said, they do a good job on this reprint. <laughs> look at a yellow brick road. <laughs> they they they're attacking Oz now. Is that a Munchkin village <laughs> right there? <laughs> Unbelievable. Just pages of war. Lots and lots of war. Look at that little hand. <laughs> it does feel like this is a foundation for uh, superhero stuff, weirdly, the way we know it. Like, you know, you can see the 80s kind of Secret War stuff, the Crisis on Infinite Earths like referencing back to this in some ways. This really does seem like it opens the door to possibilities. This is a famous page that's in that uh, Marvel Abrams mm-hmm. book for the celebrating the 50th anniversary of Marvel Comics. Uh, this is such a funny one. Uh, <laughs> Toro, let me take you to a New York hospital. It would be much safer with all these bombs falling. And Toro is looking over. See that kid with the fingers <laughs> in the V sign? Want me to go while kids like him see it through? What kind of mug do you think I am? And the little baby in a crib is saying, V, V, V is for victory, Ray. (laughs) (laughs) Man, propaganda for everybody. Does that look like uh, the Action Comics 1 baby crib? It does. It does. It also looks like that kid's in jail. It does. (laughs) And he's very muscular. Yes. Peter Dinklage would play him in the Human Torch versus Namor movie. Amazing. There's your... uh, Ares, Mars, God of War, just looming over. This is something that like comics have lost, and yeah. this and this feels very much steeped in pulp. You know, it could be like pulp magazine covers would have this kind of thing, where it's like this is an idea. That, you know, it's not a literal thing that's happening in the comic. It's a almost like an editorial illustration type of idea, just just put into a panel. Like like there's no other major examples except like those death things and stuff. But it's like a fully designed character. It calls so much attention to itself. Yeah, I like it. Uh, also, that one's probably drawn that page about 4 o'clock Saturday morning <laughs> after they've done a couple liquor store runs. Um, this kind of water spout thing, I see videos of this now from, you know, like everybody's got a camera pointed at everything. Oh, yeah. So when you see these storms roll in, like you'll see those like cyclones picking up water out of oceans. It kind of looks like that. The new one that I'm freaked out about is uh, these guys are filming uh, like a like a torrential downpour, a little bit of a flood. And something like the water being in a place where it's not usually at, it dissolves like a salt mine that's underneath the ground. So it creates fucking sinkholes that just swallow up trees and things because all the rushing water just pulls whatever's there down. Didn't know about any of that kind of thing. But see videos of that and just sees hillbillies like, oh, here it goes. Yeah, I got it. I got it. Oh, here it comes. Here it comes. And you just see everything get sucked up in there. All right, we're unleashing our squids on uh, our octopi on Berlin. The swastika, hateful emblem of the hateful regime. Looks like a faded rag as Submariner's hordes enter Berlin. So it's Submariner is villain, but he's taking care of the bad guys. You know what? He's flipped. Human Torch, this is the team-up portion of, uh, you know, a crossover, right? First we fight, 
And then we're going to team up. <laughs> yeah, but like he's still he's still in uh, world takeover mode. I love the octopus as the uh, as like a creature for this kind of thing. Like what a great alien looking kind of force in here. You'll see like early paintings of sharks and things where it's like that's not at all right, but also it's amazing. Totally. And uh, th these octopus have some of that quality. There's some good stuff at the Pittsburgh Carnegie Museum that, that I love to look at. And here's your idea of like like Hitler watching over... Germany and and in despair like what are we going to do so much hard shit to draw man Jesus whole battleship tanks shots I feel like this is probably one of the big influences on Mobius <laughs> one of the uh you know they do this stuff and it it does make me think and wonder like the depth is all wrong on this mm -hmm. stuff and and how do you make it right? Like, I think it has to do with, like, accurate perspectives and things. It, abiding by it by a vanishing point properly. But I bet you if you, like, set this up, even if it were real, like, if you arrange tanks, if you had your unlimited budget and shoot a photo, like, you're just not going to get this kind of, like, weird dynamic that you're getting in this made-up compositions and made-up perspectives. Because every once in a while, like, I'll see that stuff where it's like, no, I'm going to do this right. And then it's the worst drawing. <laughs> Here's how we have to... Uh, Establish that this is Italy that just got fucked up, man. Uh, Mussolini's proud fleet, hopelessly mired in the mud. We have from from the battleship <laughs> Mamma Mia being shouted a couple times, and then you have this fellow right here saying, "This is like being caught in a barrel of spaghetti." What a disgrace! <laughs> Jeez. Maybe that was you know a metaphor uh, back back in the day. We're still not in America yet, Jimmy. Does it come to America? It does, man, because we got to take it to the streets, man. This is the New Yorker panel. This is the one that I reference, which is like uh, another image that was in the the big Les Daniels Marvel, Marvel book. That's and a this great is, panel. And this is the part that describes how the people of New York all got to safety because he's a villain, but you can't make him so awful. Man, what a block of text yeah that's an illustrated picture book right i there. i think i wouldn't be surprised if that's a paste up where it's like just too far martin goodman's like you know we live here like we sell most of our books here like maybe you don't kill everybody in new york maybe you don't scare the kids with an impending flood that's another one of those uh you know f foreshadowing the 80s of like uh jim shooter being like dark phoenix can't kill that planet and then be fine <laughs> right yeah, which is the end of this, by the way. Like, uh, <laughs> uh, Namor gets, with all that we've seen, Namor will get uh, off scot-free, lighting the I like that. torch on the Statue of Liberty. Once again, that feels like a late-night idea. How about that Statue of Liberty head, dude? Wow. There ain't no autographed projectors in 1941, man. No, and you're not using it in your weekend of drawing 72 pages, even if there was one. <laughs> You know what there was is the uh, the trace thing where it's like you would have the pointer and you would have your pencil and you could kind of adjust like if you're going to blow it up or whatever. Oh, yeah, yeah. And you trace the, the, the drawing yeah, or the, the image, the, the reference. Yeah, the pantograph. Yeah. Yeah, old technology. So, so here's the deal. It turns out that Namor had a spell cast on him by this vixen right here, this Cleopatra-like Atlantean with these big eyes, man. But he's he's uh, did his face turn. And he's embarrassed. And he said a lot of things in motion that he and Human Torch, with a little assistance from Toro, they have to fix it all in two pages. And Jimmy, they do. Yes. Jimmy, they do. The president is granting you freedom to you and your people on condition that they behave. That's all you have to do. <laughs> <laughs> it's the word, just behave. That's amazing. <laughs> I love that Torch face. That's great. It's almost taken the uh, Rob Liefeld, Todd McFarlane, Spider-Man idea right. to the ultimate level. Such a menacing looking character. It's incredible that that's like your early prototype of a superhero. Right. It feels fanzine-ish, you know, so it's so proto. And then what a great ending, dude. Just a big old question mark. Mm -hmm. There it is, dude. First big crossover in comics history. It, it's an elemental war. Water versus fire. And uh, in this 1999 edition, you got a little piece of verbosity from uh, Roy Thomas, who is, you know, publisher of Alter Ego fanzine for decades and decades and decades. Always kept his foot in the uh, Alter Ego universe. Drops a lot of science about the creation of these characters, 
their earliest interactions and everything that went into building this this issue. Uh, for some reason, probably having to do with postal regulations, Goodman decided there should be a second Human Torch number no. five. This one with a fall instead of a summer 1941 cover date. And this number five was a real humdinger. Bizarre. Super bizarre. Uh, I like this reprint. It's a, it's a really nice reprint. You you can know, we've looked at so many reprints and so many I think are done poorly. This is a really good package. I think that Chip Kid was out by then doing his thing. And this, you know, this is close. Yeah. I what think year is there a... 1999. That's pretty early for a nice, uh, you know, like keeping the yellow pages and everything. Like, That's what I'm it's, saying. It's really nice. Like, like I don't think it would have happened if if uh, Chip Kid didn't sort of allow everybody to realize that that that's a that's a cool thing. You know, from uh, we live in this golden age of reprints and collections and everything. I feel like this is a really nice piece in the history of like how we've gotten to good reproductions of today. This is kind of a missing link. Yeah, not bad. Not bad, yes, in 1999. You know, even the credits pages are pretty tasteful. Good stuff. I'm glad we, we looked at this. I'm sorry I read the wrong one. It is mentioned in that Roy Thomas afterward, but I'm thrilled to look through it, and it's one that'll be on my list now. Yeah, so so the thing that you read, it, it was still the interaction between... It Ke was, yeah, and it was the same creative... Well, I mean, it's Burgos and uh, Everett are credited as the artist. It's probably nicer looking than this one. Right? It is not. It is not. No? No, it's 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 raw stuff. <laughs> but it's like 20 pages worth about, even though it's kind of like there's a little bit in issue 8 and a little bit in issue 10, but really the crossover is issue 9 of that Marvel Mystery Comics. Right. Um, but much, you know, nowhere near the bells and whistles that you have here. Like, they really look like they're going for it here. For sure, man. Uh, you can find this in the dollar bins, man. I, there's almost never a dollar bin that that I dig through that has a big mishmash that does not have this exact issue in there. Yeah, very cool. K, you, you, K Fab affect me on this one. <laughs> K Faber's like, follow, subscribe to the YouTube channel, hit the bell. We'll notify you when new vids are available. Can K Fabers get to mitigate that K Fab effect? By watching us uh, record these videos on the live stream, they provide uh, instant feedback that we're watching uh, while putting these videos together, but uh, they get the completed episodes uh, before anybody else also with their support uh, to the channel. But the videos are brought to you predominantly by the books that we make. So, Jimmy, please tell the people what you have uh, forthcoming. Street Angel, Princess of Poverty is my next release. It'll be out in July from Image Comics. 20th anniversary of Street Angel collects all the Street Angel comics that are not in Street Angel Deadliest Girl Alive, including one that has not seen print before, plus a lot of bonus art. So pre-order that one now wherever you get books. Uh, also, pick up Street Angel Deadliest Girl Alive back in print after almost a year out of print. So if you missed it the first time, you're in luck. I also have Hulk Grand Design and The Plain Janes, and you can join me on patreon.com slash jimrug where you can see my latest comics being serialized every Tuesday. Hip Hop Family Tree Omnibus is coming out in 2023, collecting the four volumes of the big Hip Hop Family Tree Treasury Editions, as well as 140 pages of additional art and supplemental materials, man, to become a 504-page phone book of fantastic comics. Scoop this up in time for the holidays. Let us know how many of these things we need to uh, to print up when we're about to hit that button. It's going to be important information for us to have. There are two existing uh, trade paperbacks of Red Room out there right now. And this is the cover to Red Room Crypto Killers 1, which is going to be the final miniseries of Red Room. Murder on the Dark Web for Fun and Profit. Uh, it's going to start in May on a monthly basis. This is the cover for two. And uh, there are three volumes of X-Men Grand Design out there right now and WYSIWYG. Jimmy, tell the people what else is out there, dude. Subscribe to the Cartoonist Kayfabe newsletter at the links below this video. You can also find Cartoonist Kayfabe t-shirts, merchandise, hats, mugs, stickers, and lots more at our spread shop. That link is also under this video. All great ways to support the Cartoonist Kayfabe channel. Give them those marching orders and we'll be on our way. Read more comics.